You are listening to the Get Global Podcast, a weekly journey into the international business landscape with leaders, knowers, and doers from around the world who share their stories and insights on the issues that matter most. Get Global brings you the best to help you thrive in foreign markets. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Julian Luthold, the CEO and founder of Get Global, and I have today Daryl Bricker, the CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, a uh, major public affairs and, and polling company. And um, he was previously the director of research of the prime minister's office in 1989 to 1990, giving him a perspective on how the government views some of the topics that we'll t- talk about today. Um, but he's been the CEO at Ipsos Public Affairs for a long time and um, is the author of many books on Canadian public opinion, as well as a frequent commentator on public opinion around the world. Thank you so much for joining us, Daryl Britter. My pleasure, Julian. So um, you've spoken quite a bit on the new Canadian and you do lots of research into uh, Canada today, um, as well as the rest of the world. But what do you think is uh, the zeitgeist of Canada right now? What is going on with Canadians and with Canada? Well, when you look at Canadians today, they're generally pretty satisfied with how things are going and generally pretty satisfied with their lives. But when they uh, look over the hood of the car, in other words, the direction that the the country is headed in, they're a lot less sanguine about the future. So uh, overall, generally optimistic at the moment, but when they look forward into the future, say, for example, the next 10 years, they have a lot of questions about what that's going to bring and are certainly a lot less comfortable about that than they are about present circumstances. What do you see as, uh, you know, on that horizon, uh, the, the key uh, factors that are causing mm, uncertainty or anxiety? One of them is uh, cultural change. So Canada brings in more immigrants than just about any nation, or actually more immigrants than any nation in the world per capita. Uh, and it's it's changing a lot of our cities. It's changing a lot of our communities. People are a bit uncomfortable with that. Not as uncomfortable, for example, as they are in the United States or maybe they are in continental Europe. But it's it's a growing level of uh, discomfort with the amount of cultural change that we're going through. Uh, you can also roll in technological change and the impact that uh, changing technology is going to have on uh, their lives. You know everything from you know where we're going to shop to uh, how we're going to do transactions with government and what happens with their data. I mean, if you ask people their biggest security concerns in Canada these days, it has to do with the potential for data breaches and cyber hacking. So they're worried about the future. They're worried about the future of technology. Uh, they're also worried about the economy. Where are the jobs going to be coming from in the future? There's a lot of concern around that. Uh, and just generally speaking, how we're going to pay for what's a, a pretty enviable lifestyle, I would say, in the world. Uh, has got people concerned. You know, everything from the cost of uh, uh, buying a home to the the size of their tax bill every year. So, uh, you know, there's four or five things there that Canadians are pretty anxious about. And here in the United States, there is uh, a constant thread of anti-trade sentiment or uh, anti um, import or or an impulse for import substitution. You know, a, a variety of flavors and arguments that you see in the media. Is um, is trade factored into any of this? How how are Canadian views on trade, particularly in light of NAFTA? One of the biggest uh, tra- changes that's happened, the biggest transitions that, that's happened in Canadian public opinion, is the growth in public support for trade. So, if you go back to the time you were talking about my time in politics back in the late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties, trade was an extremely important issue on the, on on the Canadian public agenda. So. That's when we were going through the free trade agreement with the United States that eventually transformed into NAFTA. Um, we had a you know a big national election, big national debate about international trade back at that time, and you know then we went through a very uh, strong recession along with the rest of the world that a lot of people in Canada attributed to the fact that we had uh, uh, found ourselves in a more liberal trade environment. Uh, they weren't thinking that it was such a good idea back then. But if you look over the space of the last Uh, nearly 30 years now, um, those numbers have moved from probably the low 20s now up into the mid 70s of Canadians thinking that more liberal trade is actually a good thing. Why do you think they feel that way? 
because there's been a lot of success that's been related uh, to the uh, free trade relationship that we have, especially with the United States. A lot of economic success in Canada has, has, uh, has, uh, has come from that. And also, you know, other things, everything from how easy, much easier it is to get across the border for most Canadians through to, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the impact on, uh, you know, the availability of uh, some goods and services, the cost of some goods and services. People see a lot of benefits uh, related to that, but they also recognize that Canada is a trading nation and that for order, order for our economy or domestic economy to be successful, that we have to be engaged in, in trade. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't a certain percentage of Canadians who are looking at expanded international trade and saying, you know, uh, that's uh, exporting jobs or some of the same things that you would hear in the United States. But it's definitely not as prevalent a voice in Canada as it is in the United States. Do you have any hypotheses about why the United States feels this way toward Canada, uh, especially given the fact that uh, Canada is our largest export market by a long stretch, you know, almost you know, two and a half times as large as China. Well, I think, uh, you know, if you told that to the average American, they would be extremely shocked by that. So in the United States, when people think about trade, they generally think about two things. They think about the loss of jobs um, to places like Mexico and China, and then they buy into, uh, and this is not everybody, of course, but, you know, a decisive number of Americans. Uh, they buy into what Donald Trump said about, you know, America... Um, not necessarily negotiating the best possible trade deals that they could negotiate. So there's a lot of people, uh, and a, I should say a decisive number of people in the United States, based on how the political system works there, that have decided that trade's not necessarily in their best interest. I mean, we did, uh, we did interview people, and we have interviewed people, on the question of what they think about NAFTA. I would say that the best that you could say in the United States right now is opinion is divided. Mm. How has that changed since the negotiations began? Uh, it's remained relatively constant. I, I think the one thing that they do uh, that uh, um, that's different between Canada and the United States, though, and this is a vulnerability for the Canadian government, is that in the United States, there's not a huge expectation that Donald Trump is going to be able to negotiate anything really that much better, or is going to be able to preserve NAFTA or change it or what. It's it's not. There's not a perception that he's got. Uh, uh, the ability to actually get a better deal for the United States, um, whereas in uh, in Canada, the prevailing uh, uh, perception is that uh, this government should be able to do a reasonably good job of that. So from a political risk factor uh, position uh, in the United States, given that people really aren't that aware with uh, about the, uh, uh, the, the trade relationship between Canada and the United States, if something goes... Uh, um, uh, wrong in terms of negotiating with Canada, I don't know that there would be a lot of you know deep concern in the United States about that, at least not, not immediately. And they're not necessarily thinking that Donald Trump will be able to negotiate a great deal anyway. Do you think that this process has had much of an effect on Canadian opinion toward um, the United States and Americans? Uh, I would say right now that Canadians are basically looking at the United States and anything that's negative that's coming from there through the lens of Donald Trump. So it's become very personal, a very personalized perspective. It's not necessarily being seen as being about the United States as much as it's seeing about the current president. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, how do Canadians feel about the rest of the world? Um, the United States, I mean, uh, rather uh, China, uh, major trading partners like the EU, where you have a, an interesting trade agreement that was closed recently? Right. So the EU, uh, Canadians really don't know that much about it. Uh, they're, not really, they're not really tracking it that much. Um, and uh, to the extent that they would have a view about a trading relationship with continental Europe, or in, in this instance, maybe even the UK as well, we would be pretty positively disposed to that. China is another question. Uh, there, it, there's a, a, a level of concern about the agenda of the Chinese government, uh, particularly the, and how that agenda manifests itself in, in terms of its uh, you know, external commercial relationships that has Canadians concerned. So, for example, if uh, uh, you know, a, a French company, for example, came in and bought up a, a Canadian asset, a significant Canadian asset, there wouldn't be a huge amount of public concern about that. But if a Chinese company, particularly one that was aligned with the Chinese state, 
came in and bought up the same asset, there'd be a fairly uh, vigorous public debate about that. Why do you feel that is? Uh, because people look at China and they uh, have a lot of questions about a combination of human rights, but also motivations on behalf of the Chinese government. Like, why are they doing this? What are they up to? Uh, they don't see them as a democracy or as a, I would say, a, a normalized state that they would see, say, for example, a place like Germany is. And uh, so moving on from China, though, um, how about the other TPP countries? Uh, Generally speaking, pretty, pretty good. I mean, the only one that, I mean, the, the countries that tend to get the most uh, concern from Canadians tend to be countries like, for example, Russia or China, uh, or ones where they feel that there's a, you know, a bit of tension associated with the relationship, even a country like Iran, for example. But you know, countries in most of the countries, say, for example, Vietnam or, or uh, you know, Thailand or uh, uh, Malaysia or Indonesia, Canadians don't really have strong opinions about that. But what I would say about the Pacific is that it is becoming more of a priority for Canadians, and the reason for that is twofold. Number one, our population is growing fastest, closest to our uh, our, our Pacific uh, our Pacific uh, shore. So, uh, Canadian, the, the orientation of the Canadian population is rotating from what used to be an Atlantic uh, 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 vista to one that's more Pacific oriented. Uh, and then the second thing, when you look at the immigration, and I mentioned that Canada has uh, uh, one of the highest, well, actually the highest per capita immigrant rate in the world. Uh, almost all of those immigrants are coming from Pacific nations, the top three nations being the Philippines, uh, India slash Pakistan, and, uh, and, um, uh, and China. In fact, China used to be number one, but it's now back to number three. Now, switching gears for a moment to talk more about India, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau went to India recently and um, had a complicated trip. Uh, there was some tension around. It's very, very charitably put, Julian. <laughs> yeah. As an India specialist, um, you know, I, I listen a lot to how the Indians talk about this, and I know that it's a, kind of a prickly place for, for, uh, for certain issues involving other countries. But um, uh, so as a, as a very brief overview for those who might not have caught this news, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau went there. It was a longer than normal trip. There were a lot of uh, activities in areas that are particularly important to domestic audiences in Canada, uh, especially Punjab, where there's a large Sikh population, but it's also where there was a separatist movement for uh, proposed Khalistan. Um, and uh, this caused some tensions uh, with the government. It seemed like he wanted to sort of slide through the middle, Trudeau did, and um, not uh, you know, tip off <laughs> his Indian greeters, but also not ignore the needs of his domestic audiences. And it, it just didn't work out. Um, how did this land in, uh, in Canada? Uh, was there much of a reaction that, that you've seen in numbers, if not in media commentary? How would you parse that? Well, I would say the, the, uh, the media commentary was uh, universally negative. Um, in terms of its actual impact on public opinion, uh, we haven't seen any polling yet that suggests that it's, uh, it's, it's really caused him a difficulty. Uh, but the problem with, uh, with Justin Trudeau as our prime minister, when it comes to public opinion, is that it's, uh, it's a very delicate balancing act uh, between being the sort of new age uh, um, uh, engine of change that he wants to present himself as and just coming across a little bit like a game show host. And, um, it, you know, it, depending on how he positions himself uh, and depending on how things go, it could go one way or the other. Uh, for the most part, uh, Canadians have been pretty impressed with uh, uh, this you know, sort of new positive, youthful, vibrant, feminist, uh, you know, uh, liberal positioning that he's, he's put on the world stage. But uh, given what happened in India, it's a combination of two things. Uh, one, there's sort of a, a, a cringeworthy level of virtue signaling that takes place uh, uh, through our prime minister. He sincerely feels it, but it, it, it can can't come off to people who are on the other side of this. And more serious people is really shallow in virtue signaling. And then the other part of it, when you confront an issue that's really 
very serious. And remember, the biggest uh, terrorist incident in Canadian history was actually one that was associated with uh, the Sikh community uh, and the uh, Sikh independence movement here in Canada. Uh, so to go over to India and, and manage that issue pretty poorly, I think that's the universal assessment uh, if, you, if you read the press, uh, all of that adds up into uh, our current prime minister coming off as not quite ready for the big job that he's taken on. So uh, it, it, was, it was not a good week for him. Uh, I don't know that we would necessarily uh, see it in the polling immediately, but I'm sure that there were many uh, conservative and NDP attack ads uh, that now have uh, uh, visuals for the next election campaign. How important to uh, campaigns are incidents like these? Um, is is the, the Sikh community large enough or significant enough to cause some real damage if they decided to make noise about this? No. Or would this be? No, okay. It doesn't seem like it is. It's not. And the, the, the bigger, the bigger problem, the, the bigger thing for him, uh, for the prime minister is, in spite of this, uh, you know, uh, you know, presentation of, uh, of of the government as you know, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, you know flower children. Basically, that's the way they come across. Um, is that uh, they're actually quite ruthless about who their political uh, who their political coalition is or uh, where they're competing for votes. And the new Canadian population, particularly the new Canadian suburban population in places like Vancouver and around the city of Toronto. Uh, um, those ridings become extremely, what we call, our constituents would call them ridings, uh, um, among new Canadians become, uh, they're, they're the only places in, in the country really that are up for grabs, that are likely to switch back and forth between the two major parties in an election campaign. So the foreign trip was probably as much about that as it was about anything. Um, and uh, the, uh, the problem, of course, is if you handle it badly, uh, it, it, it's, it's embarrassing in those communities, but it's also embarrassing among the general population as well. And, you know, you, you can come up to your own assessment as to whether or not it's fair or unfair uh, that uh, what happened in India is, uh, is being treated as it is here in Canada, which is, uh, it's, you know, probably one of the biggest foreign trip disasters that's ever happened. But that's universally what the media coverage has been. I mean, there's been a, you know, as always in the media, a couple of people who tried to go the other way just to be a bit contrarian. But the consensus has been pretty brutal. Mm. In general, uh, not counting this incident, um, do do Canadians feel that uh, despite his mm, media personality and his uh, his presence around the world um, as sort of a champion of the causes that you mentioned, do they feel like he also delivers the goods, or is he more of a figurehead? Not so far, no. Okay, not so far, no. And in fact, that's that's where the criticism is starting to come. So today they're going to be uh, they're going to be uh, announcing their new federal budget. So it's similar to what happens in the United States, except yours comes through Congress, ours comes from the executive branch. Um, the uh, they'll be coming forward with their new budget. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what they prioritize, and the other part of that, what kind of progress that they're going to claim that they've made, because they've basically staked out a couple of issues that are really really fundamental to them. One of them is the equity issue, you know, the idea that you have a 50-50 cabinet and that, you know, you'll see foreign policy through a feminist perspective and whatever that means. And, you know, uh, the, the, this whole issue of equity and representation is a really big deal for them. So they uh, probably would be seen as being relatively successful on that front. Then they've laid out a couple of other things that they thought they feel are really, really important. One of them is carbon. So dealing with global warming and carbon, uh, whatever strategy that they've put forward on that front has not gone very well. And uh, over the space of the next couple of months may even go worse, it, particularly if the province of Ontario goes in the direction that it appears to be doing in the polls right now. And that's going to uh, vote for the Progressive Conservative Party. And the problem with that is that they've already said that they won't support a carbon tax. So the biggest province in the country won't do it. That's a big problem for the federal government. So carbon is something that they haven't made a lot of progress on. The other part of that, and it's extremely important to Western Canada, is finding ways to get our oil and gas product products to Tidewater. 
to diversify our, our, our export sources. Now, you can get into all sorts of arguments about whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether there's a market, whether there isn't. But the belief, particularly in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, or actually in Manitoba and Alberta, Alberta being a very significant province in our country, particularly economically, that they're not getting supported by the federal government and that a big pipeline project, the Trans Mountain Pipeline Project, seems to be stalled, even though the federal government has said that it should go ahead and that they support it. Another big problem for the government. And then the mm. other one is sort of the innovation and jobs agenda, big projects that are supposed to be happening in terms of infrastructure and other things. There's been very little that's actually happened other than rhetoric from the government on that question that people could really point to as saying, yeah, that's a big difference that they've made. So they're now approaching the mid part of their election or mid part of their term. They're now getting into that you know, ramp up to the next election campaign. And the perceptions of Canadians, if you went out and did a survey saying, you know, what's the one big thing this government has done? Apart from, like I said, the equity and the representation aspect, it's pretty hard for them to point to anything. Mm. And uh, so they'll, they'll probably be taken to task on that in, in the media coming up and uh, probably prompted to move on that. Do you think that they'll have the ability to do that? Well, and this is the problem that they've got, particularly on the pipeline, because it's uh, it's one of those ones where uh, they're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, decide which side of the fence that they're on. Um, and uh, uh, they've already said, you know, that we really support this pipeline, but they've really not put anything into trying to sell it to pre people in the province of British Columbia, so that it could get delayed by people who would normally support the Liberal Party, who are progressive voters in this country, that they're the ones that are most opposed to it, is a really big problem for the government. So, uh, yeah, it's the easy stuff like the, uh, you know, doing state dinners with Obama and all the Canadian entertainers at the White House and, uh, you know, marching in various parades and giving speeches in various places. That The easy stuff is over. Now people are going to be expecting that they're somehow going to deliver. And when they look back at what it is that they have delivered, they probably have some things that you know, on taxation, things that they said that they've committed to for the middle class and all the rest of it, that they might be able to say, you know, this is, this is something that we've done for you. But um, it's, 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 a, it's a whole series of things that people would really have to think about in terms of whether or not it actually made a difference in their lives. So that's a, an interesting segue for us. You know, one of the things that came out of our, uh, our main event, Get Global, in 2017, back in October, was that, uh, and, and we've seen some We've seen it since at World Economic Forum and other places that uh, there's this weird dichotomy between uh, economic success, growth in almost every country in the world right now, and um, uh, and at the same time there is this element of social and economic anxiety that's having both uh, that, that's having real political effects and and social effects. Um, in your research and, and what you know through the polling and your sense of these things, uh, what can you make of all of this and, and, and where do you think it's going? Uh, yeah, the anxiety is real. Uh, the, the thing that people usually point to is, uh, as the, uh, the, the product of all of this is populism. And I don't, um, at least in the research that we're doing, and we do this around the world, don't see any abating of the, uh, of the, the tension that's created, uh, this groundswell of support for populist options, particularly kind of nationalist right-wing options. Not entirely of that ilk, but of, uh, you know, from that, uh, that, that more sort of a populist uh, perspective. Um, it's being driven by a couple of things. One of them is this sense out there that the economy is rigged to the advantage of some people, and there's a lot of people being left behind by that. But the other part is something that I pointed to at the start of our conversation, which was cultural change. I think one of the issues that uh, the uh, intellectual crowd has with trying to understand populism is we, we tend to have a bias. And that bias is to see everything in terms of economics. So we want to see problems as being economic in nature because, quite frankly, we understand them. It's a polite conversation. Should taxes be higher or lower? Uh, should trade be more open or, you know, are trade barriers higher? Uh, should we have, you know, more uh, uh, social assistance programs in a country? Should we change our healthcare system? 
you know, they can be pretty animated types of debates. Uh, but they're not anything like the debates that take place on the nationalist front. What it, what it means to be, say, for example, a real American. The sorts of forces that we saw that really elected Donald Trump in the United States, which weren't mostly economic, by the way, were mostly about cultural change. And intellectuals have a really hard time with that. And the reason is, first of all, they just want to dismiss it as sort of uh, uh, rank racism. They don't really want to deal with it. They blow past it and they try to find some sort of an economic explanation. And the problem that that creates is that what it means is smart people aren't dealing with it. Uh, if there's anything that people listening to this should pay attention to, I would think, it's the fact that this is not necessarily about economics. It's about this cultural, nationalist, real American, you know, real Brit, real French person, that, that sentiment, that, that feeling that those, those cultures, that those people felt uh, they understood and they felt that they were part of, those communities that they felt that they were part of, have been threatened, mostly as a result of immigration. And I don't think that um, our politicians have done a great job engaging with that issue because it's one that they're uncomfortable with. And uh, if I was to say anything, it would be that we have to wake up to this because we've got to get smarter minds trying to deal with it. So here in the United States, uh, you know, mentioning culture that way is oftentimes a, uh, a dog whistle for darker impulses. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, there's probably an argument to may be made that, you know, uh, maybe they... Maybe they feel like the what they grew up in is is being altered, and they have no control over that. And it's not because they hate people or something like that. It's just that they like what they had, and they feel that's changing. What do you feel is the line uh, between these ideas? Because you you were careful to mention um, that it's not it's not necessarily tied to that. It's 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 specific to culture. Yeah, it is. It's they feel the world around them is changing, and that they're not part of it. Um, and they feel like strangers in their own land. Um, whether that's fair or not, that's how they feel. Um, so how do you deal with that? Uh, by understanding it's not an argument about the depths of somebody's compassion, and by understanding that it's not an argument about what makes the economy great, like going out and uh, talking about the, you know, the number of immigrants that we need in the country because of our birth rate or whatever, our declining fertility rates. It's more about talking about how these things help how immigration and community change, cultural change, helps in individual communities around the country. So talking to people about what's happening on their front door and out in, in their neighbor's house and down the street and how it's actually advantageous and moving it beyond big groups and big numbers down to individuals. Because it's, it's, it's typical, like, as we see, and, you know, I work in the public affairs business, you know, everybody hates, uh, hates the insurance industry, but they all like their insurance agent. Right. So how do, how do, last question. So how do we make that work? Right. Last question. Um, what makes Canadians different from Americans? Uh, from the American perspective, we often kind of think of them as uh, very close cousins. Um, but I think that that evades nuance. What's your, what's your view? I, I think that there's a, a, that sense of national, uh, uh, you know, commitment to kind of a national identity that exists in the United States doesn't exist to the same degree here. So uh, the reason that we're able to, uh, one of the reasons that we're able to go through such cultural change here without seeing the kind of animosity that we've seen in the United States, and I'm not saying that there isn't a certain amount of it, but certainly not as animating as it was in the United States, um, is because there's not this strong sense of what a Canadian is or what it takes to be Canadian. We don't, we don't really have that. It's, it tends to be more of an understanding of kind of acceptance and this idea that you really don't have a right to tell people how to live their lives. Uh, that sort of judgmental, you know, from either uh, sometimes a cultural position or a religious position, that idea that you, can, you have the, the right to tell somebody else how to live is something that, that really rubs Canadians the wrong way. There's this idea that our fundamental value is tolerance and it's live and let live. Uh, so to the extent that... Um, uh, that Canadians would differ. I, th I think it's a bit more on that. So it would feel more similar to what you would feel in a place like on the coasts in the United States mm -hmm. or in a bigger university city. That's more of a sort of a general cultural uh, uh, um, a, a cultural similarity from coast to coast here in this country. 
And when, when foreign companies acquaint themselves with the Canadian mind and Canadianness, um, would you say that that's a point of view that they need to internalize? Is there anything else? Yeah, I, there's, I think that there's a, probably more of a, um, a continental sense of, uh, of uh, for example, things like workers' rights and things like that here in this country. The idea that uh, you know, having a strong regulatory system is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, that free enterprise isn't always right. Uh, so it's a more complicated, almost a, a bit more European uh, type of uh, work environment and business environment here in this country than it would be in the United States. Daryl, thank you so much for making time and speaking with us today. Uh, a treasure trove of really great information. Um, really appreciate it, and I hope we can do this again soon. My pleasure, Julian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to find out more about our events and get more global intel every week, sign up for our newsletter at getglobal.co.